Welcome to our Bible study. We have just completed the wisdom series and we learned so much from the book of Proverbs. This week we are moving into a new series. We are moving into a new book of the Bible that we'll be studying from and that book is the book of 1 Corinthians. So I want to welcome you. If you didn't as yet hit the subscribe button, why not do that right now? It's either on this side or it's on this side and of course hit the share button and send this to people you care about so that they can be enlightened by the Word of God. As I said, we are starting in the book of 1 Corinthians today, and I know you to begin reading already from the book of 1 Corinthians. Some background into the book of 1 Corinthians. Anyone can tell me who wrote the book of 1 Corinthians? You can put it in the comments below. Who wrote the book of 1 Corinthians? If you said Paul the Apostle, then you are correct. Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians and it's believed that he wrote it around 55 to 60 AD. And the book of Corinthians was written to the Corinthian church, the Corinthian church being located in Corinth. And Corinth was one of the wealthy cities that existed in that time. The reason that they were a wealthy city is because Corinth was located next to an harbor. And because of the harbor, there, were a lot, there was a lot of trade and commerce that was going on. This led to the Corinthian church being a wealthy church and as well this church was located in a mostly Gentile area. So most of the Christians of the Corinthian church were Gentiles. Unfortunately the Corinthian church had a lot of issues because there were a lot of um, sin that entered into the church because of the environment that the church was situated in. And the fact that these were new believers that were now brought in to the body of Christ, being once Gentiles, but now being in the family of Christ. So Paul had to write them some letters, giving them instructions. And we're going to be studying from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So grab your Bible, grab a pen, grab a notepad to take, take some notes and turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians is in the New Testament, all right? So 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we are going to be tackling a big topic today. And that topic is, why are there so many denominations? Why are there so many denominations? All right. And let's begin. We're going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 to 17. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 to 17. So let's read together. It says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Hmm. And there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you by brethren, by those of Chloe's house, that there are contentions among you. So basically there was division in the church of Corinth. What's the division? Now I say to you that each of you say, I am of Paul, I am of Apostle, or I am of Caiaphas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? So Paul is asking the question, why are you categorizing yourself into different factions inside of the church? Some were saying they were of Apollos. Some of Caiaphas, some were saying they were of Paul, some were saying they were of Christ. And this was leading to division. And wherever there is division and disunity, there is lack in the ability to really propel forward as a team, as a unit, or as the body of Christ, as a church. So Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you. You don't have an excuse to say, well, I am. you should be of Paul. Because Paul is saying, I didn't baptize any of you, except probably for um, Crippus and Gaius, hopefully I pronounced that correct. Least any one of you should say, I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to be to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not of wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effort. So what is a denomination? A denomination is a religious group that has slightly different beliefs from other groups that share the same religion. All right. So in Christianity, we have a lot of denominations, a lot of different groups that share similar beliefs as us. Here we see that this was an issue that plagued the early church in Corinthian. 
they started to divide among themselves based on who baptized them. You know, who was the one that brought them in to salvation. And this would have been a minor issue at the time. And Paul addressed it and it was rectified at that time in the Korean church. However, later down in history, this began to cause a lot of separation in the church. And as we speak about denominations, I'm sure you're quite familiar with a lot of the different denominations that exist. And here in Trinidad, there are quite a number of denominations that are very popular in our nation. And I want us to firstly look at the major denominations around the world. And there are a few major denominations, and I'm going to show you what these major denominations are and the amount of people that is on average following each one of these denominations. So the major or the biggest Christian denominations around the world, firstly we have Catholicism, Roman Catholic, and that has a following of roughly 1.329 billion, all right? That's, that's how many people would have been registered as members of the Catholic Church around the world, right? That's, they, they are looking at registered membership. Then we have Protestant, Protestantism, which is around 9 million. We have Eastern Orthodoxy, 220 million. Oriental Orthodoxy, 62 million. Non-Trinitarian Restoration, which is 35 million and then eastern protestant christianity which is at 22 million so i know what you're thinking right what are what are all these denominations about like these are large denominations some of them you probably even did, never heard the name before and you're wondering what what are they about what 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 do they stand by what are what do they believe and i'm gonna just focus on the top three which is catholicism protestantism and Eastern Orthodox and share a little bit more on what these major three largest denominations around the world, what they believe and how they differ. And you'd see as we go through them, you'll start to realize some of the major denominations in our nation of Trinidad, you'll start to see them come into form as we get into the second largest um, Christian denomination on the list. So first we have Roman Catholics, right? And Roman Catholics, their means of salvation is they believe in God's grace, which Christians receive by faith and by observing the sacraments, right? And the sacraments and ordinances that they believe are baptism, um, the Lord's Supper, penance. They believe in confirmation, in marriage, in holy, holy orders and anointing of the sick, all right? The organization is known as the pap um, Papal. And it's a clergy in local churches and it's presided over by the bishop. The Pope or the Bishop of the Roman of the of Rome is the ultimate church leader. So that one person and one man, the, bishop, the Pope, holds all authority over all the churches under the Roman Catholic schism. Um, they do not ordain women as preachers, and um, you can be an infant or a, a professing Christian to get baptized. So they believe in water baptism of infants through the sprinkling of water. So that's Roman Catholic. Then we have Protestants, also known as Evangelicals, also known as Reformational. And here's where we're going to find a lot more familiarity. It might sound a lot more familiar as we get into Protestants, right? And the founder is Martin Luther. He was the first person to basically break away from Roman Catholic because he believed in a, some different perspectives when it comes to the Bible. One of the main beliefs that Martin Luther ha held strongly that differed from the Roman Catholic Church is that he believed that the Bible was the final authoritative word of God, all right? Because the Roman Catholic Church, they believed in the Pope having an authoritative word and they believed in supplementary books holding that authoritative word. But Martin Luther believed that the Bible was the only thing that held that authoritative word of God. And he also believed that one can be saved through faith only and not by works. In other words, he did not believe in penance or confession for the salvation of your sins. He didn't believe that the father, or meaning, meaning the father of the Catholic Church that you would attend, can forgive you of your sins. He believed that only Jesus could forgive you of your sins. So, Protestants, they emphasize the priesthood of all believers. They believe in justification by faith alone rather than by good works, the teaching that salvation comes by divine grace 
or unmerited favor. So there's no way to earn your salvation. That's the only way. Not as merited, and they affirm the Bible as being the sole highest authority rather than also rather than also with sacred tradition. And here now we have some major branches that come out of the Protestant movement, right? Because it started as a movement. And some of the major branches that came out is Adventist, Angelical, Baptist, Calvinism, Lutheranism, Methodist, and Pentecostal. Now, there are more branches that came out of Protestant, right? Um, these are just some of them that I listed for our study today. And you would see that out of it, we have Baptist, right? Um, Baptist, Calvinism, Lutheranism, and Pentecostal. Um, the major difference between these um, branches of Protestants, they're very small differences, but some of the major differences come down to um, the, different, the beliefs in the honoring of sacrament and the beliefs in the Trinity and the beliefs in salvation. So Calvinism, they believe in one saved and always saved. They believe that you cannot lose your salvation, right? And Calvinism was started by John Calvin. Lutherism, which was started by, well, founded by and continued on by Martin Luther, they believed in, um, they believed as well, similar to, Cal they, similar to Calvinism in the aspect of one saved and always saved. And they also believed in um, babies, baby baptism, right? Um, by sprinkling of blood. Then we have the Baptists as well. They believed in baptism. They believed that baptism was not for babies, was for those that had uh, made a conscious decision to follow Christ and they believed in full submersion when it came to baptism. And also in, Bapti in, in all Baptist, Calvinism and Lutheranism, they all believe in monotheism, one God. And they do believe in the Trinity, but their explanation of the Trinity differs. And then we have Pentecostal and Pentecostal, um, they were born from the Azusa Street Revivals in 1906. Um, and Pentecostal, mostly they have a strong emphasis on the belief of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the evidence of tongues, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Hence the name Pentecostal coming from the day of Pentecost. All right. Um, and then we have like the charismatic movement, which is a branch of Pentecostal, which is very similar to Pentecostal. They believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the word charisma. All right. And then, so all these branches of Christianity that we are speaking about, and definitely we find very often in Trinidad, is from the Protestant or Evangelical movement. Most of them branched out from that, okay? And the third largest, the third largest denomination that we're speaking about is the Eastern Orthodox. So the Eastern Orthodox Church considered itself to be the one holy Catholic and apostolic church established by Christ and his apostles. Eastern Orthodox see the Bible as a collection of inspired texts that sprung out of this tradition, not the other way around. So it doesn't believe that the word of God is, the Bible is the inspired word of God and then the, their religion, Eastern Orthodox, sprung out of it, but instead they believe that their Eastern Orthodox <laughs> is a tradition that was then supplemented by the Bible, so to speak. And the choice made in forming the New Testament as having come from comparison with already firmly established faith. So they believe that um, the New Testament, the, their faith was established before the New Testament. The New Testament was written based on their faith, right? Eastern Orthodox. So Eastern Orthodox is what we're going to see in the next slide. They are basically a breakaway, a direct, the first and direct breakaway from the Roman Catholic Church. So how do we come to this place? How do we come to this place where there are so many different denominations? And they, they vary by such small differences. It's honestly, while reading through and studying and preparing, um, there were so many different um, denominations and the variations were so, so small. It was... It, it began to get a little bit confusing trying to remember, okay, this one differs by this, this one differs by this, this one differs by this. How did we reach here? How did we reach here after 2,021 years from the birth of Jesus Christ to where all these different 
forms of Christianity. They believe in Jesus, but they hold different doctrinal or theological beliefs. And I'm going to show you a diagram that is going to help simplify how did we reach to this point? You know, how is there, there are so many different branch of Christianities that existed over the many decades? And here we have a family tree of the denominations, right? So let's try to follow along. Um, hopefully you can see the writing. I will read it as well for you to help out. And this first line here is the original church. The first church is the undivided church. And there was something known as the Great Schism which occurred between the Eastern Orthodox and the Western or the Western Church, which is the Roman Catholic Church. And that occurred in 1054, the year 1054, right? In that time, there was a split where the early church, the original church, the church that was established by Jesus Christ, was split into the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. And we just... We covered the Orthodox Church, the third, third largest um, denomination, and we covered the Roman Catholic Church, the first largest denomination, right? And we see how they split here over the years. They continued from that split, right? Now, from, from the Catholic Church now, we have in 1534, we have that split into the Anglican Church, and the Anglican Church is where they believed in the Pope or the father of the church being able to marry. Then in 1738, we have the Methodist Church. And then from the Methodist Church in 1901, we have the Pentecostal Church and we have the Charismatic Church. Again, from the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church, we have the split to the Calvinism or the Reformation Movement. Um, and that started in 1570. We have Calvinism, the Lutheranian Church, and another called Anabaptist Church. From the Calvinist Church, we have con Congregationalism. And uh, we have Baptists. From Baptists, we have the Church of Christ, the Adventists, and we have um, Baptists as well. From Calvinism, we have Presbyterians, all right? So, they see all, the, all, all this is basically the quote-unquote family tree, the history, lineage of all these different denominations. And as you can see, um, they happen over many of years. But the main thing is that all the different breakaways that occurred was because somebody believed that something should be done differently. And in some cases, I do agree that the reasons for breaking away from these denominations were valid. For example, um, breaking away from the Catholic Church where Martin Luther would have started the Reformation movement because the Catholic Church was, ch was charging people a, a, a value. Like they had to actually pay for the forgiveness of their sins and they also had to pay for their family members that were already dead so that their souls could be could enter into heaven, all right? And that was completely unbiblical and it was unjust to the poorer people in society because it really exploited the poorer communities. So yeah, I agree in the breakaways, right? But I think that what happened over all these, all these years and all these different breakaways is that while each one tried to do something slightly different, what really happened is that it created a lot of division. And we're coming back to our main text that we're studying from where in the Corinthian church, the same thing happened where some were saying they were of Apollos, some were saying they were of Paul, some were saying they were of Caiaphas, and this was beginning to cause division. And what all these denominations have caused inadvertently while they started out of good intention, you know, Pentecostals came from the Azusa Street Revivals where there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit similar to how it was on the day of Pentecost, that outpouring upon all flesh is speaking in tongues, um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, they streamlined into Pentecostalism and, and charismatic movement to, to um, enable a free flow of the Holy Spirit and to teach more and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And while all these denominations started off with good intentions, all these different splits started with good intentions, and for good reasons, what they have inadvertently caused over the many of years is a lot of division within the church. And Paul speaks about this division. He says that we ought not to be divided. We should all be one. And where I lie on these, um, these divisions is I believe that we should be like the early church right here the undivided church the first church that existed the church that jesus christ established and i believe to be like that church we have to stick to the bible as the authoritative word of god we have to stick to the principles of the bible 
as that which guides our life and that which guides our theology. So what does that mean? That means that I, I identify as non-denominational. So if somebody would ask me, um, which denomination of Christianity you fall under, I would say I'm non-denominational. All right. And my reason for that is because I believe that we have to be the undivided church. We have to be the first church. We can't be divided by all these different beliefs, right? I want you to pay note of something, okay? In all these divisions of denominations of Christianity, what you will notice is nowhere is Jehovah Witness mentioned as a denomination of Christianity, all right? In all my studies that I did, all the articles that I read, none of them when mentioning different denominations, mention Jehovah Witness, all right? So I want to just put that out. Jehovah Witness is not considered a denomination of Christianity. And if you study some more into the beliefs, you'd see that the beliefs vary significantly from what Christianity, the beliefs of Christianity are and the general beliefs. So all these, all these denominations that you see here, they are all believed to have very similar beliefs and scholars have grouped them together as all being Christian because of the small differences in their beliefs, which lead them to be different denominations, right? So what should be our final decision when it comes to these different denominations of Christianity? I know some of us, I have I know a lot of people that are Pentecostal. I know people that are Presbyterian. I know people that are Roman Catholic. How, what should be our stance? Does it mean that because you are of a Pentecostal church that you should just say, well, okay, um, I, um, I should leave this church and I should find a non-denominational church. Um, no, that's not what I'm saying in this study. What I'm saying is that the main thing is that even if you are part of a denomination, that you don't let the differences in your beliefs divide us as a church. Because at the end of the day, regardless of which denomination you're in, once you believe in Jesus Christ, you have access to heaven, all right? That is the only requirement to salvation, that you believe in Jesus, right? That you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. And this, this study today is stated talking about being, about all these denominations and the fact that I'm saying I'm non-denominational doesn't mean that any one of these denominations, if you're a part of it, that you now are not saved anymore, you're not a Christian anymore. That's not what it is. It just means that you are part of something that has a slightly different belief, but it, you are still a Christian. You are still part of the body of Christ. So the main point that I want to get across is that we don't let denominations divide us. All right. We don't let denominations divide us. The greatest tool of the enemy is to divide the church. And the more that he could divide us, the more we say, I'm not working with I'm not working with Presbyterians because they believe something different from me. Or I'm not talking to Roman Catholics because they believe something to me different from me. They, and, and the more we do that, the more that we become divided and the weaker we are as the body of Christ. The body of Christ, the church of God, is the strongest force that exists on this planet, right? It's the strongest movement that existed. What Jesus started over 2,000 years ago was the greatest movement to ever exist. And it has something that is so valuable, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right. The Bible tells us that the kingdom of heaven is like a precious pool that a man um, finds in a field. When he finds it, he purchases the entire, purchases the field to ensure that he could have this pool. It's, it's very precious. So we can't become divided and then lose the real message, which is that Jesus came to save humanity because God loved this world. And because of that division, we now... We now hate another denomination. We don't want to have any affiliation with them. And this causes a lot of problems. What was Paul saying? He, Paul was saying, let us not be divided. Let's go back to our, our text that we are studying from. Paul said, I plead with you by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing and there be no division among you. Now, I know that this line here, which talks about you all speak the same thing, is very important. That's why at times people tend to segregate into dis different denominations because they want to say we all must have the same beliefs, all must have the same exact beliefs. I do believe that we must speak the same thing. But when it comes to our beliefs, the core beliefs are what needs to be the same. The core beliefs. What do I mean by that? The core beliefs is that you believe Jesus is the Son of God. You believe in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. 
You believe the Bible is the final authoritative word of God. It's inspired by God. And you believe that the Holy Spirit is... Um, the Holy Spirit has been poured out among all flesh on the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit still moves in this day and age. Those core beliefs must be the same. The, differs that we, the differences that we have could come down to small, small things that wouldn't change your salvation. It wouldn't change the message of Jesus Christ. And there are small things that don't really change the message. For example, um, dress code, song selection, um, maybe even um, things like um, sacraments, you know, whether you, whether you do washing of feet or not. You know, these things are minor things. And sometimes we become so fixated on these small things, it causes a lot of division. He says, please, please, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, speak the same thing. Let there be no division. Let's stop saying, I am of this one, and I am of that one, and I am of this, and I am of that. No, let's be one in the body of Christ. And I, I, he says that, let there be no division, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. How do we become perfectly joined together? When we have the mind of Christ, when we all put on the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ, that's what imp what's important. Not what Luther said, not what Calvin said, not what, um, not what the Pope said, not what all these different people that started, all these different denominations said, but what the mind of Christ is, what the heart of Christ is. How do we know the heart of Christ? It's written in the Bible. Let us put on the same mind, the same heart, and let's not have, be of the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you by my brethren, of those of the Chloe house, that there are contentions among you. And contention speaks to rivalry. And that's what, ha that's what happening a lot when it comes to these denominations. And even in denominations, we have contentions, again, between this church, different churches that have different pastors, that have slightly different cultures, slightly different systems, and all of this causes contentions. This is not what Paul wanted. This is not what Jesus wanted. Now I say to each one of you, I to each one of you who says that I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Caiaphas, I am of Christ, is Christ divided? And that's the question that we really need to answer. Is Christ divided? Is Jesus divided? And the answer to that is no. Hence, his church should not be divided. So, what then should we do? Should we leave those churches that are denominations? No, we should definitely not. But we should aim towards working in unity and stop the division that existed, exists because of denominations. And for those that are part of Influence Church, you might be wondering, so if someone asks me what denomination I am, what should I say, right? Should I say I'm non-denominational? And um, on, um, yeah, that is correct. That is correct. However, I know that saying non-denominational can be a tongue twister time so me my tongue kind of gets t twisted up a little bit trying to say it so i think the answer to what denomination you are simply lies in what the bible says you should be because at the end of the day you will not find the orthodox church you will not find catholic you will not find anglican you will not find methodist you will not find baptist you will not find um Lutheran, you would not find calvinism you would not find pentecostalism you would not find um presbyterianism you would not find um you would not find charismatic movement you would not find any of these words any of these names for who you are in the bible what does the bible call us the bible calls us christians acts 11 verse 26 it says and when he had found him he brought him to Antioch, and so it was for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called, what's that word? They were first called Christians. They were called Christians in Antioch. Then Acts 26 verse 28. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become what? Not to become a Pentecostal, not to become a Catholic. Not to become a Presbyterian, not to become, not to become a Calvinist. What did he persuade him to become? A Christian. This is what we should be called, Christians. First Peter 4.16 Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. We should be Christians. What does the word Christian mean? It means Christ-like. This is what it means. This is what Paul was saying by having the same mind, 
and being of the same judgment by being Christ-like, by crucifying this flesh. And nevertheless, this flesh lives, this body lives, but Christ now lives within us. That is what we should be. So I am not, I am non-denominational. I am not of any, I don't affiliate with any denomination of Christianity. And that's simply because I believe the Bible says we should be Christians. I believe in every denomination there are variations as well that are heavily based on culture and are not so much based on what the Word of God says. And that is something that we definitely need to pay close attention to and be cautious of, that we don't stray away from the biblical teachings to based off faith on culture. All right. So, for example, something that is very popular in our culture might be... Um, word of faith and word of faith is known as when i speak something i believe it will happen all right and that is not biblical and the word of faith movement tends to use the scripture a lot which says death and life lies in the power of the tongue however the only words that has power is the words of god and yes god has given us that power in the name of jesus and that power and authority has given us in the name of jesus is over sickness is over demons all right that power he's, he's given us in the name of Jesus is not to claim a new um, Honda vessel and say, this Honda vessel is mine in Jesus' name, all right? And the prosperity gospel as well, you know, the name it and claim it gospel, the sowing a seed and you would, be, you would receive this amount. So you put $10,000 and you would be able to get this new car or you put $20,000 and you'll be getting a miracle. That comes back to similar, similarly to penance that would have been something that Roman Catholics did which was where Luther, Luther broke off from Catholicism because of that. So all these things that are popular in our, in our culture right now, they are not biblical. And while it may not be termed as a denomination, and sometimes they are, you know, they are to, to consider themselves an entire body all in itself, all these things we need to be wary about because all these things cause division. And all these things are not being truly a Christian, having the mind and the heart of Jesus Christ. So next time somebody asks you what denomination you are, the answer is you are a Christian. All right, so that brings us to the end of our study for tonight. It was a shorter study than we usually have. And I know there may be questions. So what you could do is you can message me on WhatsApp or you can send a comment on the stream and let me know what are your questions. Um, and I will be feel free. I will feel free to send me your questions. I will respond and I will answer them. I know this is a big topic of denominations. Um, my main thing is that I I hope and I wish that I did not I that I that I did not offend anyone. The purpose of this was not to offend in any way, to not to criticize because offending and criticizing comes back to causing division. And my aim is not to cause division, but for us as the body of Christ to unite together, right? Regardless of what denomination we are let's all be christians let's all stand together let's all do the work that christ has left into our hands the work that he left into our hands is to go into all the world preach the gospel to every creature baptize them in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit let's do that and let's do it together and as we do it together the church will be an unstoppable force christians we will be an unstoppable force in this world that will turn it upside down just like the disciples did on the day of Pentecost when they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. They went out as an unstoppable force. They were together. They were united. They were not divided by if it's Peter, if it's Paul, if it's John. They were not divided. They stood as one. And that, that is what held the power in the gospel as the early church progressed. And we have the gospel today because of the early church uniting together, staying together as one and not letting division creep into the church that's why paul addressed it and my hope and prayer as we address this topic right now in this session is that likewise the words of paul in first corinthians will help us to come to a place where we no longer are divided based on denominations but we unite together as the body of christ so i do pray that you are blessed by this study like i said you can shoot me any questions and next week, we continue in the book of 1 Corinthians. So continue reading through the book of 1 Corinthians. If you could do five chapters a day, that's five chapters a day is awesome. Five chapters a week is awesome. All right. Um, but let's go through the book of 1 Corinthians. Next week, we'll continue. And as we study 1 Corinthians, there's a lot of doctrinal and theological aspects that we'll touch on. And hopefully, you'll get answers to a lot of questions that you've had for a long while. So take care. Enjoy the rest of 
your whether it's day night whatever time you're looking at the stream enjoy the rest of that season god bless